Today marks the first Sunday in the season of Lent. As you know, the season, Lenten season comes in the 40 days preceding Easter, not including Sundays. So Lent actually lasts about 46 days or so. Usually when we think of the Lent, we think of a time of reflection, a time to consider the life and ministry of, of Jesus that led him to the cross and to the victory of the empty tomb. Typically, when we think of Lent, um, the event in the life of Jesus that is representative of the season is the passage that we read today, Jesus in the wilderness. This passage, we have all, you know, we have all the classic signs and symbols of focusing on God. First, there is a period of time, 40 days. The number 40, while it certainly can be a literal, a literal number, has a greater theological significance. For example, have this thing control. For example, Moses spent 40 days and 40 nights on Mount Sinai in the presence of God while waiting for, waiting to receive 10 commandments in Exodus 34. A nation of Israel wanders for 40 years in desert before entering the land of Canaan. The, the prophet Elijah retreats for 40 days after he encountered with the, the prophets of Abel and the um, and, and threat by the Queen Jezebel. Jesus, the, the Luke addresses the, the significance of Jesus' time in the desert in this way. So we know God is at work here in Jesus' life because Luke places the Spirit of God front and center in this particular event. Jesus is a full of the Spirit and led by the Spirit into the wilderness, wilderness and spent his 40 days to confirm his call and to deepen their understanding of God's will. So something else I want to pay attention is at where the work of God takes place, not in a town or city, not in a synagogue or even temple itself, certainly not at a seminary. It was the wilderness. And it symbolized a new place to encounter God, the most profound way. We have a hard time truly understanding the significance of the temple in Jerusalem, though. The massive, this massive structure that dominate, dominated the city of Jerusalem was thought to be the place where God dwelled among the humankind, and God was worshipped and uh, honored by righteous worshipers there. But... The wilderness has a long and marvelous history of being the place where God is found. Wilderness has always been a place of seclusion, of, of, of revelation, and of danger. Moses encounters God in the burning bush in the desert. And it is that encounter that set the deliverance of God's people and the beginning of the history of Israel and the world. The, the, the wilderness is where the law of God was given, where prophets retreat to find God again, and God sent, where God sends John the Baptist to preach and baptize. So Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness. God is up to something. And the wilderness is the place where Jesus is to meet God, his Father, and a place of his final preparation. It's like a, as a boot camp before he begins his ministry. So he spends 40 days in prayer and deep listening. 
After spending 40 days in the wilderness in fasting, we are told Jesus encounters the three temptations or tests. They highlight the contrast and conflict between this world and the kingdom of God. The first temptation is the same type of temptation that Adam and Eve faced in the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden. But in Jesus' case, Satan challenged him with, uh, challenges him with a question by saying, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Of course, Jesus is a son of God, and of course, he possesses the power to turn stones into bread. After all, he turns the water into wine and multiplies the, the bread and fish. And if you've been to uh, Palestine at all, the one thing that you will see plentiful would be stones everywhere absolutely plentiful so turning one stone into bread there's no harm there but the contrast between this world's system and the kingdom of God is this who do you trust for your daily provision when Jesus quotes the scripture back to Satan, he recalls the, the ex Exodus experience and the, the fear of the, the Israelites when uh, that, that they were they would starve in the desert. They went, they want to go back to Egypt because at least they had food there. Israel would have traded uh, the freedom to freedom for food freedom for food and in in a sense affirming that the power of Pharaoh was greater than the power the power of God by Jesus quote uh, the, from Deuteronomy 8, chapter 8 verse 3 where Moses is a re reminding the people in their history and their mistakes and how they are to live in the future when they get to promised land and what was that? What was the point of that? The point wasn't that you don't need food, or the, the reading the Bible is this good substitute for a meal. The point is, who do you trust? Do you trust the words of Pharaoh, or do you trust God to feed you? This world or God's kingdom, that's the point of the first temptation and the temptation Jesus had to overcome before entering his ministry. Because you see, he would have to, to face this temptation all throughout his life. Having this possession, the power in his possession, he would have, he would have been, been tempted to just take care of his needs just a little bit. What is there, where is the harm there? Let me just take care of me and my disciples, uh, some, some nice meals. And then he would have to deal with that con temptation constantly. So the fir very first temptation he had to overcome was, was, was his own needs, his own uh, desires. The second temptation raises the level of conflict. Satan takes Jesus up on a high place. Perhaps imagine a place like this, place like the, the Twin Towers in San Francisco. And Luke says, it, says it shows him in an instant all the kingdom of the world, and then Satan offers all he sees to Jesus and asks him the second question, if you worship me, it will all be yours. One quick submission, one quick compromise to s Satan, it would make, make, make it easy, uh, it would be much easier to achieve his, his mission. And then with all the money and power, imagine that, with all the money and power in his possession, how quickly can he achieve his goal? How easily would be able to make his job done, complete? 
But Jesus knows that there is no shortcut in glory, no easy way to claim his rightful place as a king of kings and the Lord of lords. And the only way is the way to the cross. And Jesus chooses that instead of the power and glory of this world. Finally, the last temptation is the one last vain attempt to call into questioning the character of God. So Satan dares to Jesus with the final temptation by quoting the scripture. You see that Jesus has been re 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 answering the temptations with the words from the Deuteronomy. So the finally, the, the final temptation Satan got, got wise, and so, okay, well, you are quoting the Bible, so let me quote the Bible too. So, and they said, if you are the Son of God, and he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. A reference comes from the, the, the uh, Psalm chapter 91. So they're standing on top of uh, the, the temple. The temple is, unlike the, the, the wilderness, is a center, city square, center of the city where the, lots and lots of people will be gathered you know, in very variety of reasons. And the temple will be the highest place in the city. If, you know, some of you have been to Europe where you learn that, that you're not allowed to build the buildings that are taller than the cathedrals, and, you know, that's the kind of the same, uh, you know, the purpose. So standing on top of the, uh, the, uh, the temple would be uh, not only be your uh, highest point of the city, but you'll be all seen by the, the crowd, the large crowd there. And so if you just jump and the land is safely on the ground, everyone would, be, it would know that. You will be the talk of town immediately, and then, and then he'll get that instant street cred. And, and then so everyone will, will hear. And it was about seeking fame and instant um, popularity. Once again, it would have been, uh, made his mission much easier to achieve by doing that. And with this stunt, he would gain an immediate recognition, popularity and recognition, and everyone would, would know and listen and follow. But Jesus' reply is, however, don't put God to the test. Either you trust God or not. Either you either believe what, G, what God says or you don't. Either you either give your life and all you are to God or you don't. Jesus choose, chose God even if his way leads him to the cross. During these next 40 days, our time in the wilderness is a time to reflect on our own choices. We are, are we choosing the kingdom of God or kingdoms of this world? Do we trust the provision of God or frantic consumer? consumer culture in which we live? Do we live by kingdom values which are not the values of the power and might projected by government and politicians? Jesus was tempted for two reasons, I think. First, so that, that he could become the representation of righteous Israel. In every temptation Jesus faced Israel, as a nation had already faced them and failed. In the manna, in the desert, or the quest for the kingdom power and the failure to trust God, Israel had failed almost every test she had been given. When Jesus resists the, the, uh, Satan, and affirms his faithfulness to the kingdom of God, Jesus becomes a representative of all of God's people. And this will give him the right to die for the sins of all God's people on the cross. 
But Jesus was also tempted to demonstrate that we can choose the kingdom of God over the kingdom, uh, kingdoms of the world. In order to, to proclaim God's kingdom, Jesus had to choose it. If we are to proclaim God's kingdom, we too must choose it. We must make a conscious choice to live our lives differently with a different values than the current world system. After the special general conference ruling, we are facing an uncertain future. We are thrown into a deeper dilemma and challenges. It will be a very difficult, uh, it, it will be overwhelming to all of us. And then, and then we are forced to make some important choices. How would we come to those choices? Would it be by our human minds and the world values or the kingdom of God? That is what our time in the wilderness is about during the Lenten season. Three questions in the wilderness are also before us. How would you answer them? What choice will we make? Let us seek answers in prayer and deep listening. And let us choose to follow the Lord, not the world, but follow the Lord to faithful, uh, faithfully in this journey to the cross. Amen.